Good morning. A rail strike has been averted after Democrats in the House and Senate passed legislation that would forestall economic pain for all Americans, except, of course, the millions of people who work our nation's railways. Biden and Democrats say the new railway contract must be signed because a strike would cause 750,000 job losses and a recession, which, as we all know, is Fed Chief Jerome Powell's responsibility, right? Isn't the whole idea of raising interest rates, isn't he trying to cause job losses and a recession to cool off the economy? But you can't have the threat of a railway strike. That doesn't, doesn't sit well with Biden. Last quarter, the major railroad companies each earned $1 billion in profits. Uh, I'm sorry, last quarter, last quarter, there are four quarters in a year. Last quarter, the major railroad companies each earned $1 billion in profits, but no money for sick leave. Well, people whose job it is to transport oil, chemicals, hazardous waste, flammable liquids on our trains are forced to show up to work even when they're sick. What could possibly go wrong? Four railway unions rejected the settlement, which they will now have to abide by once Biden signs it into law. That would be Amtrak Joe Biden. Biden defended this new contract, saying, quote, I negotiated a contract no one else could negotiate. Of course nobody else could negotiate it. Nobody else could literally strong arm a deal through Congress and force one side to agree. And that one side, of course, would be labor, not management. That's not a negotiation. What happened is Luca Brazzi held a gun to the railway workers' head, and Joe Biden assured them that either their brains or their signature would be on the contract. True story. And may your first child be a masculine child. Amtrak Joe Biden said, while Democrats are in favor of paid sick leave, the bill doesn't provide paid sick leave only because Republicans voted against paid sick leave, which is why Democrats had no choice but to vote for the bill. I need paid sick leave right now just from trying to untangle the verbal gymnastics Biden employs to screw the unions. Amtrak Joe Biden claims he's the most pro-union president in American history. Yeah, he's pro-union the same way Simon Cowell is pro-nature taking its course. Speaking of bogus cosmetics, the democratically controlled Senate staged a vote to inject paid sick leave into the railway bill, but they knew it would go down in defeat. Every Democrat, however, voted in favor of paid sick leave for railway workers, except for, you guessed it, Joe Manchin, who, to play it safe, should travel by plane in the foreseeable future. French President Emmanuel Macron visited the White House Thursday for an official state dinner during his toast. Biden called France America's oldest ally. Macron then stood up and said Biden is France's oldest ally. The White House welcomed the French president by holding an official state dinner. As is customary at all official dinners, a Secret Service agent was assigned to taste and then chew Joe Biden's food. He's 80. So somebody has to taste and chew his food. Biden, of course, is the oldest president this country has ever had. So the state dinner began at 530 so he wouldn't miss wheel. Uh, the day before, President Biden met in the White House with Republican leaders Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell. You know, Mr. President, just because Donald Trump welcomes two ultra right wing bigots into his home, that doesn't mean you have to as well. New polling shows Trump's influence with Republicans is waning as moderates in the party worry his recent dinner in Mar-a-Lago 
didn't include enough white supremacists, Nazis, and anti-Semites. Meanwhile, on Wednesday, it was announced Kanye was officially divorced from reality. Then, on Thursday, Kanye appeared on Alex Jones's InfoWars. Is it just me, or did Kanye sound a tad anti-Semitic on InfoWars yesterday? Maybe I'm overly uh, sensitive, but I picked up some Jew-hating dog whistles. I'm done with the classifications. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table, especially Hitler especially Hitler. I don't know, am I reading too much into Kanye saying that Hitler had something of value? Might be. Uh, watch uh, my accounts because they've been frozen by the Jewish uh, banks. So I, I need to watch my mills. There, that. Am I, am I being overly sensitive? In case you didn't hear, Kanye appeared on Infowars Thursday to tell Alex Jones, quote, I like Hitler. You told us that already last week, Kanye, when you dined with him at Mar-a-Lago. I watched the interview and Alex Jones <laughs> sounded like Ted Koppel with Al Campanis, trying to give Kanye an off-ramp to reverse course, but Kanye stepped on the pedal and just went straight ahead. I get the, uh, the Hugo Boss uniforms, amazing. Uh, but I mean, just because you're in love with the design, you're a designer. Can we just kind of say, like, you like the, the you like the uniforms? But that's about no, it. No, we we no. I, there, there's a lot of things that I love about Hitler. A lot of things. <laughs> when I heard that, I thought, no way, that's Kanye on Infowars. That is most definitely a crisis actor. For fans of Alex Jones, the most offensive part of Kanye's appearance was his decision to come on the show wearing a mask. We don't wear masks on Infowars. It's Joe Rogan country. We're anti-mask and anti-vax. You know, it takes a lot to unnerve Alex Jones, but Kanye actually succeeded. I really studied a lot of history, plus I had family that was there. And so, I mean, I, I don't think Hitler was a good guy. You know, I, I'm not a marketing guru, but it seems to me there's a problem with your brand, Alex Jones, when you find yourself having to assure your audience that you don't think Hitler was a good guy. Alex Jones doesn't think Hitler was a, was a good guy. Way to go out on a limb there, Alex Jones. Um, and, and the Nazis, in my view, were thugs that shook people down to a lot of really bad things. But they did good things, too. We're going to stop dissing the Nazis all the time. Okay. Kanye doesn't mean it. He's just trying to own the libs, get under their skin. He's just trying to own the Jews. He doesn't mean it. Kanye isn't anti-Semitic. He's just pro-Holocaust. There's a big difference. Well, CNN says why people are evil Nazis, so... I mean, I, I, I disagree with both statements, but I get the yeah, I, don't, I don't like the word evil next to Nazis. I think we need to look at. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we laughed. It's farce. 3,000 more appearances like this one on InfoWars, and I think ye, I think ye is through. I think he has 3,000 more appearances like this one. Uh, nobody's going to want to talk to him again. So... Kanye's comrade in armbands is 24-year-old Nazi, literally a Nazi, Nick Fuentes. And I've played clips of Nick Fuentes on the show. He is a Holocaust denier, loves using the N-word, you know, the whole thing. He's all in on it. And when there are complicated issues, uh, I often look to see where politicians or pundits fall. So it gives me some insight into what I should believe. For example... I always want to know what Bernie thinks, and that's about it. So Ukraine, for example, very complicated. I have spoken adamantly about negotiating some sort of peace. However, I'm very wary of the people who are urging Biden to stop funding the war, even though I kind of agree with them. But I'd like to know who's saying this and who they are. So. Here's why I'm a little suspicious of the people who say we should defund 
America's involvement in Ukraine. Here is Nick Fuentes, the Nazi, on with Alex Jones yesterday with Kanye. And Kanye and Nick Fuentes are telling Alex Jones that they're pro-Putin. In terms of Ukraine and Russia, I haven't really seen so much of that in the news. I'm, of course, pro-Putin. I'm very pro-Russia. Um, you know, I am also. Let's go. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, you see that this is just an extension of the United States, neocon establishment, New World Order type stuff. See, I'm not, I'm not sure why people would be pro-Putin. Uh, and when you're pro-Putin... You're pro-white, you're anti-LGBTQ, you're pro-authoritarian, you're anti-democracy, you're in favor of this Christian Caucasian. It's uh, no coincidence that the far right, the Republican Party, have a hard time distancing themselves from Putin. And they'll always couch it in you know, equivocations about Ukraine being run by Nazis. Uh, I admit it's complicated, but I have a serious problem with the Jackson Hinkles, the Jimmy Doors, the Nick Fuentes of the world, who all seem to be rooting for Putin. Something doesn't seem right. Kevin McCarthy wants to be speaker. He's trying to build a coalition of mental defectives in the Republican Party. And after meeting with Joe Biden at the White House this week, he was asked about Donald Trump's meeting with Nick Fuentes, the Nazi. McCarthy, who lies, said that Trump had no idea who Nick Fuentes was. And then he lied and said Trump condemned him. He didn't. If you remember, Trump also claimed back in 2016 he had no idea who KKK leader David Duke was after David Duke endorsed him. Here is Nick Fuentes and Kanye dispelling any notion that Donald Trump had no idea who Nick Fuentes was or wanted to disown him. And fake, it wasn't a tweet, it was a truth social after truth social after truth social. So give them the rundown on that. Yeah, so initially mm. we didn't publish anything about the dinner. It was rumored that Ye went to dinner with Trump. Then it was rumored that I was at the dinner because I walked through the airport in Miami. Then there was a statement from Jason Miller, who spoke as a representative for Trump, and he said, well, Nick Fuentes was not at the dinner. And it was only at that point, which was a lie, it was only at that point when we began to respond, and Ye said, he can't say that. Nick was at the dinner. That was a lie. But I mean, I actually like the speeches that Jason Miller wrote. Maybe, I mean, he was just scared. Of course, Trump knew who Nick Fuentes is. He knows who Kanye is. He knows what Kanye's been saying, but he still had him for dinner at Mar-a-Lago. Well, Kevin McCarthy was grilled by the press outside the White House this week and was asked whether or not he was going to demand that Marjorie Taylor Greene, who he's embracing because he needs her now, she's going to she was stripped of her committee assignments, but she's going to get them back. He's trying to build a coalition of mental defectives. He was asked uh, about Marjorie Taylor Greene's embrace of Nick Fuentes, and he lied and said she has disowned him. She hasn't. When pushed on uh, Nick Fuentes, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted, of course I reject his racist ideology. But here she is in February speaking at Nick Fuentes' American First Political Action Committee. We are honored, we are humbled and excited to welcome to the stage right now for our first speech, and we love to get to know her much better. I think this is going to be the beginning of something great. The representative from Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a power broker inside the Republican Party. She's a farce. She's a fool. She's a buffoon. But she is one of the most powerful people in the House of Representatives. 
in order to keep that coalition of mental defectives in the Republican Party together, McCarthy needs Marjorie Taylor Greene. And she knows exactly who Nick Fuentes is. She knows exactly where she was speaking. She was speaking at Nick Fuentes America First conference. America First is a racist dog whistle. We have some young people listening, so you should know that America First, the term America First, was used by the KKK in the 1920s, and then it was used in the 1930s by anti-Semites like Charles Lindbergh, who wanted to keep America out of World War II. We've heard America First a lot, the term America First. We hear it a lot ever since Trump started running for president. People of a certain age, mostly Jews, mostly uh, immigrants, uh, ethnic, ethnic people, uh, uh, they know exactly what the term America First means, which is why 80% of Jews in America despise Donald Trump. Jews know exactly who Donald Trump is and what he's up to. Jews know what America first means. When somebody like Donald Trump says they're pro-Israel, it means they want a place for Jews somewhere far, far away, somewhere other than America. That's how the final solution started, by relocating the Jews far, far away. And then the extermination part came at the very end of World War II. You know, 1941-42, they were just relocating the Jews and the gypsies and the Catholics and the communists and the LGBTQ. We're just sending them away. See, stupid people tend to be bigots. You cannot be a bigot unless you've surrendered all your intelligence. You can be smart, but if you're a bigot, you've surrendered all your smarts. And when you're stupid and bigoted, you don't know what you think. You only know how you feel. You are driven by your feelings. And people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, people like Kanye, people like Alex Jones, Nick Fuentes, they don't have any capacity to articulate what they really want. They can only tell you who they hate and how they feel, and they are easily led to commit unimaginable, unspeakable acts of horror, so long as it's all done gradually, and it's wrapped in the self-preservation of flag or Bible. It doesn't happen suddenly, it happens gradually, and before you know it, you're doing things you never thought you were capable of. Megyn Kelly made a name for herself on Fox News telling young kids that Jesus and Santa were white. And she was pretty adept at dancing around the, 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 the rim of racism, but you always knew where she stood. She was on the side of the racists. She trashed Trayvon Martin, sided with George Zimmerman. She is a racist and a bigot, which is why she was fired from NBC News when she attempted to go mainstream. She made the mistake of defending blackface and they had to get rid of her. Now she's on satellite radio and here she is being interviewed by an Australian television uh, show. It's, I think it's a network that's owned by Rupert Murdoch. Here she is attacking Will Smith for his recent apology tour. Well, let's be honest. If, if Will Smith were white and had assaulted Chris Rock, a black man at the Oscars, he would never work again a day in his life. He gets a pass because he have his skin color. Yeah, I, we all know these people. She cannot get past somebody's skin color. She just sees Will Smith as a black man. She just sees me as a Jew. Chuck Schumer is the Senate majority leader a Democrat. I don't approve of him, but in the long sweep of history, he will probably 
be remembered fondly for standing up to Trump and passing mediocre pieces of legislation during Biden's first two years in office. Look, I'm not going to defend Schumer. He is not on the side of the working class. He pays lip service to the working class. He is a corporate Democrat, and it is the corporate Democrats who create the conditions for fascism and racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, and all the other scapegoating of marginalized people. All because corporate Democrats offer no alternative to the scapegoating of the marginalized done by the Republican Party. There are two choices in an unequal society such as ours. You either blame the rich or you blame the Jews, the blacks, the immigrants for stealing your jobs. Those are your choices. You either make everyone equal or you scapegoat and you have two choices. The Republicans are supposed to scapegoat the, the Jews, the blacks, the Arabs, the Muslims, the gays, and it is the responsibility of the Democrats to scapegoat uh, the corporations and the richest 1% until we have an equal society and don't need to scapegoat everybody. Schumer and Pelosi do not scapegoat. They don't do their job, and that's their problem. They refuse to scapegoat themselves, the richest 1%. The scapegoating in America is one-sided. It is only coming from the rich and powerful on the right. In an unequal society, and this is one of the most unequal societies in the history of civilization, whether you like it or not, that's a fact. In an unequal society, someone is to blame. And if the Democrats refuse to blame Wall Street, corporate America, the billionaires, if they refuse to run candidates with calloused hands who have more debt than savings, if the Democrats refuse to run candidates with a genuine contempt for the rich and powerful, then too many Americans will get their guns and blame the blacks, the Mexicans, and the Jews for their immiseration. That's how it works. That's the way of the world. Unequal society, somebody's to blame. You either blame the rich and the powerful or you blame the Mexicans, the blacks, and the Jews. Now, let me be clear here. Scapegoating is essential in an unequal society. There are always going to be scapegoats. Scapegoat the rich and powerful. Everybody's safe. But the Democrats don't do that. All that being said... Chuck Schumer does get credit for passing the Respect for Marriage Act. Same-sex marriage is about to be codified into law. It's gone to Joe Biden's desk. It's about to become the law of the land. And this is huge because, as we all know, Clarence Thomas this year said it's time to revisit the Oberfeld decision. So it looks like it's going to be impossible now to overturn same-sex marriage. It's codified into law. But then there are people like Laura Ingram, Fox News's Laura Ingram, who is opposed to same-sex marriage, even though her brother is gay. While purporting to safeguard marital rights of same-sex couples, the law will actually end up gutting the religious liberty rights across the country. Laura Ingram opposes the Respect for Marriage Act, and yet she has three children out of wedlock. She never married, and yet she has three children. There's no husband. Surrender your conservative credentials immediately. Yesterday on Fox News, Sean Hannity predicted that after Republicans take the House on January 3rd, they will vote to impeach Joe Biden over Hunter Biden's business dealings. Really going out on a limb there, Hannity. Wow, that's some prediction. He also predicted Saturday will follow Friday. Next month is January, and a man in Florida will be arrested for trying to strangle his wife's Dildo. The House Ways and Means Committee finally has Donald Trump's tax returns after Trump spent years in court 
trying to H&R block that from ever happening. I wish I H&R blocked that sentence. Richie Neal is the Democratic chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Richie Neal is seen here realizing he finally has Donald Trump's tax returns and that Republicans take over next month, which means he now only has 32 days to pour over Trump's taxes and finally get an answer to the question that has been bugging him for years. How much does Donald Trump spend each year on Febreze? This is the question that Richie Neal, <laughs> Richie Neal, the Democratic chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, that's why he wanted the tax returns to discover how much Donald Trump spends on Febreze. With George, <laughs> Jesus. With George's Senate runoff scheduled for next Tuesday, Donald Trump said he will not hold a rally in support of Herschel Walker. Republicans say a more efficient way Trump can help is by holding a rally in support of Walker's opponent, Senator Raphael Warnick. When it comes to television advertising, Raphael Warnick is reportedly outspending Herschel Walker two to one. Herschel Walker says he's not worried because he's outspending Warnock four to zero on silencing all the women whose abortions he paid for. There are now reports that Herschel Walker, who wants to be the next senator from Georgia, listed his Texas home as his primary residence. But new polling suggests Walker will get a last minute surge at the polls Tuesday after he promised to move out of Georgia altogether. A lot of Georgia Republicans complain Walker lost some momentum going into next Tuesday by refusing to campaign over the Thanksgiving weekend. But Walker said families come first, all 50 of them. Meanwhile, Republicans are assuring voters in Georgia that when elected, Herschel Walker will become one of Washington's most beloved senators, even a potential vice presidential pick, once the American people really start getting to know less and less about him. Today, Walker said Georgia Republicans would be making a big mistake counting him out. Hey, they're Georgia Republicans. They'd be making a big mistake counting him in, counting him out, or any other kind of counting. Herschel can't count. He just can't. As most of you know, the Democrats have control of the Senate no matter who wins this race in Georgia, but not so, says Herschel. Now the committee could be even, whereas if, if uh, the Republican lose that Senate seat, then the uh, Democrat got total control. Right now, we got a chance to make all the committees even that it, that we can still do some correction on it, and and that's what I'm going to fight for. Right now, this election is more important than any election I think we ever had in history. So it's not about Herschel Walker; it's about the people of Georgia. So that's the reason I'm getting out there to keep people out there to the polls. Yes, he is the best the Republicans could find. That's the best they could do. I'm going to hold my tongue. Here is Herschel Walker being transphobic and saying uh, we've got to keep uh, men who are women out of sports and that these new IRS agents that Biden is hiring, we should, we should transfer them away from the Internal Revenue Service to patrol locker rooms to make sure men are men and women are women, and it's transphobic. And instead of trying to keep them safe, they're over there putting men in women's sports. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is how you can solve this problem. Get rid of them 87,000 IRS agents that's going to go after all of us and put one of those IRS agents in the schools to take care of our kids. That's what they need to be doing instead of going after us with these IRS agents. But yet they don't know how to spend their money. Now they want to spend your money. Uh, here is Senator uh, Raphael Warnick. If we're honest, I believe in my soul that Georgia knows that Georgia is better than Herschel Walker. Come on. Georgia is better than Herschel Walker.
Georgia is better than Herschel Walker. That's really not saying much. The bowel movement I had this morning is better than Herschel Walker. <laughs> after, five, after five women this week stepped forward to talk about how Herschel Walker physically abused them, a Democratic super PAC has begun spending $6 million on TV ads drawing attention to Herschel Walker's history of domestic violence. But I have a feeling this is going to backfire. You know, drawing attention to Herschel's history of violence against women, that's just going to energize the Republican base. Almost $80 million has been spent on TV ads for Georgia's four-week Senate runoff. $80 million. That's $20 million shy of how much it would cost to get Herschel Walker the psychiatric care he so desperately needs. Congressman Matt Gates has a best friend. His name is Joel Greenberg, a Florida tax collector who was just sentenced to 11 years in prison after his sex trafficking conviction. But because it's Florida, he could get the sentence eventually reduced for bad behavior. Instead of good behavior, it's, see, it's Florida, and uh, it's uh, you get your sentence reduced for bad. All right. Greenberg is reportedly cooperating with prosecutors in the investigation of Congressman Matt Gates, who has been accused of having sex with a 17 year old girl who he trafficked to. Washington, D.C. from Florida and paid her money. Here is uh, his best friend, uh, Greenberg's attorney, Joel, Gre uh, uh, Joel Greenberg, convicted. Uh, here is Joel Greenberg's attorney outside the courtroom yesterday after his client's, client's sentencing. The attorney uh, was asked why his client's friend, Matt Gates is not getting prosecuted for the same crime that his client was. I'm shocked. I am disappointed by a number of prostitutions that haven't been brought. Including that one? Pardon? Including that one? Let me think about how I'm going to answer that. Um, I think that there's a number of prosecutions that can be brought in the area of the SBA fraud, uh, the bribery and kickbacks, um, election um, fraud, and uh, the sex cases. That's all you're going to get from me. <laughs> I know you're going to ask it a third time in a different way, but it, you know. So that was pretty evasive. I apologize. But it's. All right. Reed Hastings is the CEO of Netflix, and he was participating in a business conference where he was asked what he thought of the new owner of Twitter, Elon Musk. Since you are a Twitter user, I should ask, and you're on there all the time, what do you think yeah. of what's going on? I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, Elon Musk is the bravest, most creative person on the planet. I mean, you know, what he's done in multiple areas is phenomenal. Um, you know, his style is different than like, I'm trying to be like a really steady, respectable leader. You know, he doesn't care. <laughs> he's just like out there, you know? He's just, he's just like out there. He, union busting, rampant racism and sexual harassment at his Tesla plants. He's endorsing Ron DeSantis for president, putting QAnon supporters back on Twitter, platforming racists, misogynists. He's out there. Hey, freedom of speech, right? That's what Elon Musk is all about, freedom of speech. Unless, of course, you criticize him on Twitter, then you're kicked off, your account is suspended, or you're fired. If you work for him and you criticize him, you're fired. Reed Hastings was then asked about Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle created some controversy, as you know, on yep. your platform. And we were we've been talking also about platforming, um, sometimes hate speech or anti-Semitic speech or other kinds of speech. How do you think about that today? Yeah. Our brand is trying to be the most exciting entertainment company in the world. And what's more exciting than transphobia and anti-Semitism? 
And Chappelle is dead center for us. He is the best, or one of the best, and that special was one of the most entertaining and watched specials we've ever had. We would do it again and again. Be because transgender people are four times as likely to be victims of violent assaults than cisgender people are. And we here at Netflix like to think we play a small part in that. So we clearly need to be more uh, obvious and direct about that, which we've done since, you know, with employees and with uh, people who care about Netflix that were about entertainment. Um, and Chappelle is very entertaining and, and, you know, provocative. And again, that's, a, that's the core of what we're doing. He's made it very clear to his Netflix employees, he has, that if they have a problem with Chappelle's transphobia, they should quit which makes perfect financial sense because it's much cheaper for a transgender employee to quit than Netflix having to fire them for exercising their First Amendment rights to speak out against transphobia on Netflix. Look, I'm all in on the First Amendment, and it will be interesting to see what happens with Kanye. It really is, because... They say the antidote to bad speech is more speech. And I have to say that watching Kanye on InfoWars, and I'm being serious here, maybe, maybe Joe Rogan uh, and the people who say just more speech, more speech, maybe Elon Musk, maybe they're right. Maybe, I think maybe Kanye was, was so ridiculous, so stupid, so over the top, so angry that maybe this much speech sheds a light on just how broken and tired anti-Semitism truly is. Maybe. I hope so. Maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe we just flood the community with so much hate speech and bigotry that potential bigots, potential shooters, we talked about stochastic terrorism, that they come to their senses, that they realize it's stupid, I've heard enough, and I'm not going to be a bigot. Uh, not sure. Not sure how that works. Uh, I have a feeling that... Uh, I have a feeling Kanye is going to hang in there. I have a feeling Kanye will say this was performance art. He'll say he was having... A psychiatric episode, and he'll rehabilitate himself like Mel Gibson did. And then a few years later, we'll see another outburst of anti Semitism. Look, uh, Reed Hastings at Netflix, you can do whatever you want. This is America. But there is such a thing, I am told as corporate values. We hear that a lot in capitalism, corporate values. What does a corporation stand for, right? Uh, and I get that, that Elon Musk and Reed Hastings and Netflix, they stand for freedom of expression, and so do I. But do they also stand for inclusivity? Because I do. Do they also stand for protecting the marginalized in our community? Do they stand for acceptance? Do they stand for disempowering bullies and making everyone feel safe? You see, freedom of speech is a wonderful corporate value, but freedom of speech is a, is a part of a suite of values. And when freedom of speech eclipses the self-worth and safety of a community that's marginalized or frightened, it, it makes people like me wonder if I want to support your brand. It makes me wonder if your corporate values are in line with mine. Again, freedom of speech. You do whatever you want. I'm not trying to silence anybody, but freedom of speech means that I have the freedom to call Dave Chappelle a transphobic who, who traffics in anti-Semitic tropes. Sorry if that triggers you, but freedom of speech. I'm sorry, I thought Dave Chappelle's monologue on SNL was anti-Semitic. 
I'm free to say that. We're all free to say whatever we want as long as it doesn't lead to violence. I worry, though, that some things that Chappelle says do lead to violence. You know, transgender women and men, four times more likely to be beaten up and killed than cisgender people. People are free to say whatever they want and people are free to react to whatever they say. It's why Moby just quit Twitter. It's why Neil Young quit Spotify to protest Joe Rogan. It's why so many people have quit Netflix. A lot of people quit Netflix uh, because of Dave Chappelle and season five of The Crown really sucked. Bad, bad, Real, like almost unwatchable. So, you know, freedom of expression allows Chappelle to erase the transgender community or traffic and stereotypes, traffic and stereotypes about Jews. But freedom of expression also allows me to bite back. Now, look, we are all born weak. We are born crippled. We are born needing others. As we reach adulthood, we are tricked into believing we're independent, but we're not. Our shared destiny is how we are born. We are born weak, we are born crippled and hungry, and no matter how many spurts of youthful delusion convince us we need nobody, as we get older, we, we are deluded into thinking we're independent. In the end, we are the way we are born, weak, crippled, and hungry. And it frightens us. It frightens us. We are all frightened. Some of us turn to others because that's all we know how to do. That's why we survived as babies. We turn to others. And then there are those who turn into themselves. They turn inward and they become frightened loners who cling to their money, their religion, their flag, their, their hatred, their bigotry. Uh, and they retreat into themselves. And once they do that, they turn their back on others and they require a grand unifying theory to explain away their pain. And they often turn to conspiracies. And conspiracies, conspiracy theories, give birth to bigotry, racism, and anti-Semitism. You cannot have the slave trade without conspiracy theories about blacks being inferior. You cannot have the Holocaust without conspiracy theories about the Jews being responsible for everything that's wrong in Germany. Where there is little to no education, where there is little to no love or security, where there are independent fools who are homeschooled, who think, who are taught to think they need nobody, that is where conspiracy theories blossom. When you traffic in conspiracy theories, when you say Democrats are pedophiles or drag queens are sexualizing children, you are no different from your run-of-the-mill racist or anti-Semite. It's all part of the same cloth. Once again, here is Alex Jones, who has made a career of trafficking in conspiracy theories. Do you guys realize that the British government created Hitler and the Milner group put him in power and there's something much more sophisticated? And I personally uh, think that most Jews are great people and I, and I understand there's a Jewish mafia and, and they're, they're used to demonize anybody that promotes freedom, but I don't blame Jews in general for that. Okay, so I, I'm going to play that again because there was laughter. Kanye and Nick Fuentes were having a good old time uh, because it's buffoonery. It's a joke, but it's not. Listen again to what Alex Jones told Nick Fuentes 
and Kanye about Hitler. Did you guys realize that the British government created Hitler and the Milner group put him in power and there's something much more sophisticated? And I personally uh, think that most Jews are great people and I, and I understand there's a Jewish mafia and, and they're, they're used to demonize anybody that promotes freedom, but I don't blame Jews in general for that. Mm -hmm. Sounds almost reasonable, kind of interesting, right? The British created Hitler. Well... Go on with that conspiracy theory. I know all about this conspiracy theory that Hitler was a Rothschild. Hitler was Jewish. Hitler staged the Holocaust, staged it. You know, like crisis actors uh, after a shooting, he staged the Holocaust. This is what Alex Jones is nibbling at, but is too chicken shit to bring up for the time being, for the time being. He sta Hitler staged the Holocaust to justify taking Palestine from the Arabs and turning it into Israel. Hitler was part of the conspiracy. See, there is not a big leap from Alex Jones saying the British created Hitler. There's not too big a leap to saying that to saying the Holocaust never happened. Alex Jones yesterday continues. Let's let's hear this other part here. Let's. And I and I understand there's a Jewish mafia, and, and they're they're used to demonize anybody that promotes freedom. But I don't blame Jews in general for that. I understand there's a Jewish mafia, and they're used to demonize people who don't believe in them. Uh, but I don't I don't blame Jews for that. That sounds almost reasonable. It's almost. What Dave Chappelle was kind of pretty much saying on SNL, there's a Jewish mafia. I should be so lucky. There's also a gay mafia. Mafia, the term mafia, is a dog whistle for a cabal, a conspiracy. It's how the ignorant, the bigoted, the ill-educated, the ill-informed explain away everything that they don't understand. It's how they explain away the pain and the trauma they haven't dealt with. They explain away, they use the term mafia, cabal, George Soros, to explain whatever they don't understand. When you say, Alex Jones, it's the Jewish mafia, you might as well just say it's the Jews. And I, and I understand there's a Jewish mafia. A Jewish mafia. We are weak, we are crippled, and we must embrace that we are all weak and crippled. Our shared destiny is our birth, our life and death, all the same. We are born crippled, hungry, and frightened, and we die that way. It's our shared destiny. We must understand the blessing of weakness. Weakness allows us, embracing the, the sanctity of our weakness allows us to live full and productive lives of forgiveness and love. Where there is no forgiveness, there is no love, and where there is no love, there is evil. And Alex Jones, look at his personal life. It is a loveless life, as is Donald Trump's, as is Kanye's, as is Nick Fuentes, who I think is a virgin. The only way somebody can be truly happy is to love, forgive, and embrace other people's weaknesses and our own. Then there are the Madison Cawthorns of the world. This is the congressman who is, I think he's about 30. He wasn't reelected. And he sadly is stuck in a wheelchair after uh, he was in a car accident. He clings to his guns. He also clings to his right-wing homophobia, even though, surprise, he was recently caught on tape 
sexually harassing a male staffer. There's also been allegations of coke-fueled parties. The tragedy of Madison Cawthorn isn't that he's in a wheelchair. The tragedy of Madison Cawthorn is he fights who he is. He fights his weakness. He doesn't embrace his weakness or the weakness in others. Listen to this speech he gave this week. He is at war with himself. He is leaving Congress, and this was his valedictory. This is what he left us with. Listen to how he, he fights through the pain, and in so doing, causes pain in others. America is weak. Her sons are sickly and her daughters are decrepit. Our country now faces the consequences of enabling a participation trophy society. We are no longer the United States. We have become the nanny state. Our young men are taught that weakness is strength, that delicacy is desirable, and that being a soft metrosexual is more valuable than training the mind, body, and soul. Social media has weakened us, siphoning our men of their will to fight, to rise in a noble manner, square their jaws, and charge once more into the breach of life to defend what they love. So on this precipice of disaster, I ask the young men of this nation a question. Will you sit behind a screen while the storied tales of your forefathers become myth? Or will you stand resolute against the dying light of America's golden age? Will you reclaim your masculinity? Will you become a man to be feared, to be respected, to be looked up to? Or will you let this nation's next generation be its final generation? With that, I yield back. That is Madison Cawthorn's farewell. Lashing out against metrosexuals because he couldn't say homosexual which he is fighting against inside. He was caught on tape caressing and sexually harassing a male employee. It is no surprise that the very tragic Madison Cawthorn, it's no surprise that he was at Mar-a-Lago in the audience when Donald Trump declared his candidacy last month. It is no surprise that Alex Jones was one of Donald Trump's earliest supporters, as was Kanye. These are broken, crippled men who hate how they were born. They refuse to accept that just like everyone else, they share the common destiny of being weak and crippled and needing others. We are all weak, we are all crippled, and we all need others, but these men fight our common destiny. They refuse to accept who they are. And that's who Trump surrounds himself with, broken souls. And broken souls become bigots, anti-Semites, and rapists. There is right and there is wrong. We all went to kindergarten. You can't say you haven't been told. You know what is right and what is wrong. You already know it. Now, I'm a Democrat because as corrupt as its leadership is, it is still the party of diversity. It should come as no surprise that the Republican Party that reinvented itself under Nixon and Reagan and became the party of white grievance it's no surprise that the Republican Party that became the party of white grievance eventually turned on the LGBTQ community, the frightened, undocumented workers. Now they're going after the Jews. Marx famously said, history repeats itself, first as tragedy, second as farce. Go watch a Trump rally. Go watch Kanye with Nick Fuentes on Alex Jones. They're laughing. They're giggling. It's a farce. When Chappelle goes on Saturday Night Live and slams the Jews or does his 18th special on Netflix celebrating transphobia, it's just a joke. It's just horseplay. He's a provocateur. Kanye's a provocateur. Nick Fuentes is laughing. And Alex Jones says when he testifies under oath 
that he's just putting on a show. Maybe, or maybe it's another tragedy repeated as farce. Maybe it's another tragedy repeated as farce. I'm all for the First Amendment, but people are getting hurt. Or in that gay bar in Colorado Springs, killed. If you enjoyed today's show, please like this and subscribe. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak.